When I talk to people about artificial intelligence, I get usually one of two questions. One is, is AI going to outsmart us in every aspect of life, and are they going to take over the world? Or the other question is, isn't artificial intelligence just another hype? It's just another gadget, another tool, another technology, and it's going to go away. Now, I want to spend a few minutes to talk about why the answer to both questions is no. So I recently, a few weeks ago, I bought a selfie drone. I don't know if any one of you has a selfie drone. So this is this little drone that flies around you and takes pictures of you. Now, this is a piece of technology. It uses drone technology, but it also uses artificial intelligence because it has face detection. So it hovers around me, tries to find my face to take a picture of me or to take videos of me. So this is how we use artificial intelligence. Now, I can't wait for artificial intelligence to be smart enough to start wondering what the heck human beings are doing. <laughs> and I imagine a conversation with my Alexa, who lives in my kitchen. You've seen her, this little robot-like uh, speaker that talks to you in human language. Um, I, I can't wait for this to happen. And I imagine the conversation being like Alexa asking me, so you just bought a selfie drone. Why? <laughs> and I will have to explain that, well, we used to have selfie sticks to pretty much perform the same task. And it's because we can't hold smartphones far enough from ourselves to take pictures of ourselves that look good enough. So now we have the selfie drone to do the same thing. They can fly a little further from us, and they know where our faces are. So this is great. And Alexa will ask, but why do you take pictures of yourself? <laughs> I don't do that. And it's hard to explain. And I will probably say something like, well, we'd like to share them with other animals of our species. We put them online so other people can see where we are and what we're doing. And Alexa will ask, but what is that good for? <laughs> and that's probably the moment where I say, well, Alexa, stop, which is the general command for her to shut up. Because honestly, it's quite difficult to find an answer and to explain why human beings do the things they do. And it's especially hard when you try to figure out what human intelligence looks like while you look at artificial intelligence. Now, human intelligence is very special. And it's very, it functions very differently from artificial intelligence. And we need to understand how human intelligence works. And we will learn that because we have artificial intelligence everywhere. Now, there are two things about human intelligence. One, it's very social. It only works because we interact. We know things because we talk to other people who validate what we think. Now, a selfie that we take is also about validation. It's about social validation. It tells us that other people like the picture that we just took of ourselves, or they hope to get a like in return, which is still social validation. Everything we do intelligently has to do with us having that need to be validated. So in the end of every piece of technology, you will find a human need. The selfie stick was a technology that we used to serve this need, and now we use selfie, dream, selfie drones to, to, to help the same cause. But we're still working on that human need in the end. Now, what is human intelligence when it's social? The other aspect is it's very context dependent. And there's a great experiment uh, that Daniel Kahneman describes, uh, Nobel laureate in economics. He says, so if you walk around a college campus and you ask people two questions, the first question is, how happy, you ask students, right? So how happy are you with your life in general right now on a scale from 1 to 10? You can do this with me. That's the first question. The second question is, how many dates did you have in the last three months? And people will give you the number. Now, you walk to a different group of students and ask the questions again, but you ask them in the other way around. Because how many dates did you have in the last three months? People start thinking, give you the number, and now you ask them, so how happy are you with your life right now? <laughs> and out of a sudden, the people who didn't go on any dates are very unhappy with their lives. <laughs> for an artificial intelligence, this context will not make a difference. But for us, it does. We use the first question as an anchor to answer the second one. For my Alexa, it won't matter in which order I ask these questions. But humans use shortcuts. 
So our intelligence is context dependent, but at the same time, it works across contexts. Artificial intelligence still, and will for the foreseeable future, just work in one context. It's made for one thing. So Alexa is great at processing human language, but she will be very bad at driving a car. We, with our brains, have to do both. And to deal with this massive amount of information, we have to use shortcuts. So we use context as a cue. Artificial intelligence tries to do that too. Now, I want to explain one thing as, as the counterpoint to that. Kasparov, a few decades ago, when they started training artificial intelligence, so they used machine learning to teach the game of chess. And Kasparov was trying to teach a computer to play chess. And the computer, out of a sudden, started sacrificing the queen in all games. Like, one of the first moves it could do was sacrificing the queen. <laughs> and they tried to figure out why it would do that. That looked like a really stupid thing to do. And it was because the artificial intelligence behind that was simple, and it started learning that when an experienced player of chess would sacrifice the queen, that usually resulted in the player winning the game. <laughs> but what happened is that experienced players of chess know they would only sacrifice the queen if that would pretty much very likely lead to them winning the game. And under no under other circumstances should you sacrifice your queen without a reason. So artificial intelligence in the beginning read the patterns that, similar to us, used shortcuts to make a conclusion. Today, we have them in forms that use deep learning mechanisms that are more complex, and they're much better at trying to figure out what an if situation is, and then what the then, then situation should look like. So the if part became way more complex. They are able to deal with a lot more situations and constellations on chess. That's why they win at chess. And they win at much more complex games than chess. But the point is, they're still only good at one game at a time. So they are domain specific. Our general intelligence works differently. OK. Now, back to Alexa. I have Alexa in my kitchen, and I have Google Home in my office. Pretty much the same system, but they don't like each other very much. <laughs> I just realized when I prepared this talk that it's pretty, pretty sexist of me to put Alexa in the kitchen. <laughs> and then I was wondering, can you actually be sexist to an artificial intelligence? Is that even possible? And then, of course, that's possible because someone decided that this is female. It has a female voice. It talks to me as a female, and it has a female name. So, of course, me putting Alexa in my kitchen is a sexist move. But I, I asked Google. So I asked Google Home, and you started by saying, OK, Google, what do you think of Alexa? <laughs> and Google Home replied, I like her blue light. I was in my office talking to Google Home, and out of a sudden, out of the kitchen, comes Alexa saying, thank you. <laughs> and for us humans, that is so creepy. <laughs> Alexa shouldn't do that. She shouldn't speak when she's not asked. But what happened? Well, I said to Google, what do you think about Alexa? And that triggered Alexa to wake up. And then she heard, I like her blue light. She couldn't figure out that that came from Google. But she knows that if there comes a sentence that starts with I like and then has a U in it, which she probably heard, that that's probably a compliment and you should say thank you. And that's what she did. Now, we have two movements that happened here. We see technologies everywhere, and especially driven by artificial intelligence, become more and more human. They talk like us, and they look like us. And if you look at robots, they try to move like us. Technologies are very different today than they used to be 20 years ago. If you think about the first time you opened Excel, that was a very different interface and a very different experience. Right? So you had to adapt to the technology. You had to learn how to use Excel. Today, technologies learn to talk like you, and they try to adapt so it's easier for you to use them. We see that in many areas of life that this can be problematic, and it can also be good. But nevertheless, it's happening. So we can't stop that anymore. But one thing we have to stop, and this is the other side, this is us. 
while technologies became more human, we became more like robots. We work like robots. We have standardized everything around our work. We have tried to figure out how we can make people all the same and measure them on the same standards. Our education system comes out of the industrialization, so everything is made to standardize. Everything that can be standardized, including us, can be automated. Everything that can be automated will be automated. If you don't want to be replaced by an artificial intelligence, you can't behave like a robot. You have to do something else. Now the question is, what drives humans? What is human intelligence if it's different from artificial intelligence? What do we need to do? And I have three things I want to say. One, it is our uniquely human intelligence. It's what you bring to the table. It's your experience, your expertise, and your very unique ability to deal with a problem that makes a difference. So we need to shift away from trying to be normal, because we tried that for a while, and it doesn't work anymore. We can't be normal. We have to be very much unique in every aspect of life. You all need to be different, because the diversity here is what creates progress. Number two, we have to work across domains. We can't stay in our field of expertise because we know context and we know how to apply intelligence to different contexts. AI can't do that yet. We need to work in different contexts and understand them, try to work outside of things we already understand. And number three, we need to shift to a massive model of collaboration. And to put that in more drastic terms, the industrialization leads us to compete. We need to stop to compete. Competition drives us to be measured on similar dimensions. To win a game of chess has very clear rules. That's why they beat us. We need to work in systems that make us collaborate. And that takes courage. And this is my final quote, and I quote a Disney movie. But what is courage? Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the realization that some things are way more important than our own fear. So rather than fearing artificial intelligence, we need to work with it, we need to collaborate with it, and we need to build a collective intelligence that makes us all smarter. With that, good luck. <laughs>